I'm Rob Skinner, and this is the Rob Skinner Podcast. If you're listening to this podcast, you're probably a person who wants to do as much good as you can for Jesus. But how do you squeeze more into an already packed schedule? The secret is to cut out low value activities. All this and more on the Rob Skinner Podcast. Welcome back to the Rob Skinner Podcast. My goal is to inspire you to live a no regrets life, make this life count, and multiply disciples, leaders, and churches. I hope you're having an amazing September. I love this month. It's my birthday month. I'm I'm turning, I won't tell you, but I'm getting up there, getting closer to Jesus every day. But anyway, it's going to be an amazing month and an amazing fall, no matter where you're at. And if you are in Indonesia, that's awesome. If you're in Japan, Hey, hey, how you guys doing out there? If you're in Korea, hope you guys are doing great there. Wherever you're at, if you're down under, just want to send you my love. This is an amazing time to serve God, and now is the time for each one of us to do as much as we can for Him. So today I'm talking about how do we do more when we're so busy? I mean, just with all the technical revolution, we have so much stuff that we've got to do in addition to our normal lives. We've got answering email. There's just so many things, so many little things that just kind of fill up the cracks in our time. So today I want to talk about cutting out low value activities. Watching the game of cornhole on TV fills me with many questions. Questions questions such as why? Another question is who are these people who are so good at this quote unquote sport? I ask myself, how many hours have they spent playing this game in order to keep getting that beanbag in the hole time after time? I also think, how did how do these people support themselves? I mean, it just seems like it's so automatic. Where does the money come from? These same questions arise when I hear of professional video game players. What really blew my mind was when I discovered someone in my church who didn't enjoy playing the video games, but enjoyed watching other people play video games on TV. I had never heard that. And I go, you will watch someone else play a video game? I go, oh my gosh. Talk about three steps away from reality. That's crazy. I didn't say that to the person, but I thought it myself. God gives us great freedom as disciples. And there are large areas that are gray areas. These are activities or behaviors that don't neatly fall under the category of right and wrong. Now, you may not be able to point out a scripture that prohibits that particular pastime. However, that doesn't mean it's something that you should pursue. What are some of these gray areas that aren't discussed in the Bible directly? Well, how about smoking cigarettes? Okay, where does it say in the Bible that you can't smoke cigarettes? It doesn't. Jesus never smoked. I don't think his disciples did. I don't know when tobacco was discovered, but it's not mentioned in the Bible. How about chewing tobacco? How about cigars? How about smoking marijuana? Smoking, you know, marijuana is not mentioned in the Bible. doesn't say that directly. And if you've got someone who's struggling with it in your church, maybe you do. That's probably the first thing we'll bring up. It says it's not prohibited in the Bible. Video games. Online news addiction. Maybe you're addicted to CNN or or Fox News or some other news outlet. TV binging. Hours of internet browsing and scrolling. Hobbies. Moses and Jesus never taught a lesson on quote-unquote spiritual views on smoking or Christ-like computer usage. It's just not in the Bible. Instead, we're left with principles to follow that address how to view areas not covered in the Bible. Paul addresses some of these areas in 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 23, he says, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. In 1 Corinthians 6, 12, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered 
by anything. Paul was dealing with sexual immorality with prostitutes in a city that had three temples dedicated to the goddess of love, Aphrodite. He was also trying to give guidance about eating food that had been sacrificed to idols. The disciples in the church were pushing back against Paul and his authority and were saying, hey, listen, you know, bug off. I've got the right to do anything as a Christian. Paul agreed, but added that not everything is constructive or beneficial. He also advised to not do anything that may be allowed but could master a person or cause an addiction. He then adds in chapter 10, 31 through 11, 1, So whether you eat or drink or or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God, even as I try to please everyone in every way. For I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Paul explains that a mature and multiplying disciple looks at behaviors and activities and evaluates their worthiness not only on whether the Bible allows or condemns them explicitly, but also by the following spiritual questions and and filters. For example, is this activity constructive? Is it going to build me up? Is it going to build up other people? Secondly, is it beneficial? Will it help me and other people? Will it master me? Can it become addictive? Will I become a slave to this? Will it choke me out and land me in the third soil? Matthew chapter 13 and verse 7 and verse 22. Will this behavior bring glory to God? Will it draw positive attention and praise to God by my doing it? Will this cause someone else to stumble, struggle, or miss the way if I do this? Maybe I can handle it, but maybe someone else can't. And am I imitating Jesus and Paul's example of seeking the good of many? Now, these are tougher questions that force us to evaluate our lives in light of God, other people, and our influence in the world. My campus minister asked me to help mentor or disciple. Okay, I'm going way back in the archives here. This is mid 80s. Okay, I'm going to say, I'm going to say this probably 1986. Okay, I was like 20 or something. So he said, hey, I want you to disciple another Christian on campus at UC Berkeley. Now, I was less than a year old spiritually, and this young man was a friend of mine, and so I planned our first time together to make it special. (laughs) We walked down to Whelan's Smoke Shop near the corner of Telegraph and Bancroft in Berkeley, and we each bought a pack of cigarettes and then went to a nearby coffee shop. We drank our coffee, we smoked our cigarettes, and looked at scriptures together. Does the Bible say you can't smoke cigarettes? No. (laughs) But after that appointment, I started thinking more deeply about it. Can smoking master me? Definitely. Is it beneficial? No. Will it cause someone else to stumble? Mm, Most likely. So, just so you know, just in case you're worried about me, that was my last smoke and D time. I threw away that pack of cigarettes. Now, I know your image of me is completely shattered right now, but you you might be hanging on to hobbies, habits, or activities from your days when you were living in the world. All of us develop patterns that are not easy to change. At the same time, they're often not clearly wrong. If you want to be a multiplying disciple, you'll need to take inventory of your life's activities. Paul warns in Ephesians 5, verse 15, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Paul says you have to be very careful how you live, not a little careful, not not just careful. He says very careful. You've got to really focus in and just examine your life carefully. That means you'll need to examine all of your current patterns and ask if they're beneficial or if they are low value or maybe even harmful for you and for others. Like the Corinthians, we can get defensive and claim our quote-unquote right to do anything we desire. We can get all uppity and just get, oh, you know, that's that's doesn't say that's wrong in the Bible. However, that's often the behavior of an immature and unfruitful Christian. 
When I see that in a person, I go, hmm, that's probably not going to lead in a good direction because we're only thinking about us and what we want to do. We're defending our behavior. We aren't asking ourselves whether this is the highest and best use of our time. Think about it this way. If you were selected to join your country's Olympic track team, what would your life and schedule look like? Would you be smoking cigarettes? Would you be just noshing on Snicker, Snickers bars, you know, chocolate bars? Would you be downing gallons of Coca-Cola every day? Would you be spending hours and hours on video games? Somehow, I don't think so. Your time would, would likely be scheduled hour by hour and even minute by minute. Your aspiration to win a gold medal would force out those low-value activities. Is it wrong to drink a Coke? Absolutely not. Is it wrong to have a Snickers bar? Definitely not. But your diet would improve because you wouldn't have time for hours of mindless TV and computer viewing, and you would spend most of your time with those who share your high ambition. Low-value behaviors would be left far behind. As Paul shares in 1 Corinthians 9.24, Do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. I find that one of the most impacting scriptures in the Bible. You know, as I've been praying in my prayer walks in the morning recently, I'm just like, God, if I could ask for one thing, it would be, give me that spirit to run to win. That's what I want. That's what I need. The the, the spirit to not make excuses to beat my body, to make it my slave, to go that little extra effort, to say no to the things that I desire and say yes to what you want for my life. The context of the chapter is that Paul had a right to get paid and supported by the Corinthians, but in order to save more people and undercut his critics, he chose to support himself financially. He was very careful how he lived. He was willing to let go of what was rightfully his if it meant more people could be saved. And that is the mature mindset of a multiplying disciple. Application. Take stock of your low-value activities. What are you spending time on that may not have high value? What one thing, if you gave it up, would open up space to do something where you could save souls, get closer to God, meditate on God, serve other people? Evaluate your gray areas. Instead of asking whether it's right or wrong, use the questions above to determine whether your life's activities are beneficial or constructive. Beat your body. Replace empty, fruitless behavior with action that will bear good fruit in your walk with God, your character, and in saving souls. Thanks for listening. Here's how you can help support the program. First, let your friends know about the podcast. Secondly, read and review one of my books either How to Plant and Grow a Church or Courage, How to Make This Life Count. You can find both of them on Amazon.com. Finally, support the program with a gift today. The link is in the show notes. I have the transcript of this lesson in my show notes as well. So if you want to use any of this material in teaching young Christians or teaching in your church, feel free. It's just wide open. Go ahead and take that and use that. I'd be glad to have you do that. And in my expositions of Matthew, please use that material if you want to use that to preach. Basically, I'm pulling that from my lessons on Sunday, so feel free to use that. Because my goal is to inspire you to make this life count, live a no-regrets life, and multiply disciples, leaders, and churches. Have a great day, and make this life count.